Good morning, everyone. We are here from Copenhagen at EAT 2025, and I have these two very special guests, and we are going to uh, a special uh, topic that is very, very, very hot right now. So I'm here with Professor Michael Borger, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Leipzig Heart Center, and Mateo Marin Cuartas, uh, who I'm very, very proud of him because he's Colombian like me. <laughs> and he is a consultant, cardiovascular surgeon at Leipzig Heart Center. So they were both in the guidelines committee. Mateo was the uh, guidelines coordinator for the valvular uh, heart disease for his um, European Society of Cardiology and the EADS. So, and you were the chair, right, of the guidelines. So of course, uh, this is a hot topic right now. They were just released one month ago. And uh, I would love to know what are the highlights in the guidelines? So maybe I'll start then, Lorena. Um, so first of all, this was obviously a collaboration between the European Society of Cardiology and uh, EACTS. This was an update of the 2021 uh, guidelines. And between 21 and 25, there were several uh, important trials that were published, several other uh, pieces of information that we felt uh, uh, were necessary to update the uh, document. And um, we have a, a very strict rules about the uh, formation of the task force with good representation from surgeons, which is not always the case for a guideline task force. And uh, we certainly you know, played a, a very uh, active role and uh, uh, really um, had a collegial interaction with the colleagues, with the cardiology colleagues and tried to avoid, you know, emotional, um, non-fact-based arguments. We tried to st stick to the evidence. And um, the evidence supports some very positive things for surgery. Uh, one thing, for example, um, we, we continue to stress the importance of the heart team, which I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. And um, we also uh, stress that more complex procedures not just transcatheter, but uh, surgical procedures should be done in the higher volume centers. Mm -hmm. And our patient representatives on the guideline uh, task force were very strong in saying that we need to stress that complex procedures need to be done in experienced centers. There's also a clear trend within the guidelines towards a movement earlier in the disease process. So we want patients being referred earlier whether that's asymptomatic aortic stenosis or asymptomatic uh, mitral regurgitation. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a class 1B recommendation, which is new for asymptomatic mitral regurgitation if patients have uh, certain criteria. But we also adjusted the um, uh, cutoffs for intervention uh, to reflect earlier intervention, especially in smaller patients, because we don't want to wait until the traditional cutoffs before you recommend intervening on the aortic or mitral or tricuspid valve because for smaller patients that means that their post-intervention mm -hmm. prognosis is worse and therefore we have indexed uh, cutoffs now for all uh, three of those valves. We also have a 2A recommendation for aortic valve repair for aortic insufficiency that was upgraded from a 2B based on increasing evidence supporting that. In general from um, a surgical perspective that there is more differentiation of valvular heart disease patients, especially with regards to functional MR, that would have a significant impact on our practice. Matteo, do you want to add yeah. something? So regarding the um, um, secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, we wanted to stress out and divide it very clearly in two different, uh, let's call it diseases, ventricular secondary MR and atrial secondary MR because of the prognostic impact of these two different uh, diseases. Because as you know, traditionally ventricular uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, it has not, as, not such a good prognosis. Uh, we were as surgeons not really wanted to operate uh, these patients and they were in some cases uh, treated with uh, transcatheter approaches. But there is a recent evidence and more and more evidence regarding the um, a good prognosis of patients with atrial MR and uh, secondary um, atrial MR if you treat them uh, timely 
especially with surgery. So if you perform ideally, uh, of course, mitral valve repair and annuloplasty in patients with atrial MR, you are completely changing the pro prognosis and life ex expectancy of these patients. And they have a improved quality of life, less uh, uh, hospitalization because of heart failure, heart failure, and of course, a better survival in the long term. Atrial SMR is uh, basically a surgical entity these patients are ideally operated on and only if they are too risky, very high risk profile, then they might be approached with a edge-to-edge -edge repair transcatheter. But these patients have, for example, a high risk of mitral stenosis and the prognostic impact on the survival is not as good if you perform a transcatheter approach. Okay, so we heard about aortic valve, mitral valve. What about the tricuspid? She for forgotten or something. So we... we um clarified a little bit the previous recommendations mm -hmm. for concomitant tricuspid valve surgery uh, with patients with left-sided heart valve disease, primarily based on the CTSN trial, saying that you definitely should, uh, or sorry, it's a, a 2A recommendation, so you should uh, repair the tricuspid mm -hmm. valve if there's moderate TR. And then a 2B recommendation is that you can repair the tricuspid valve if there's uh, significant annular dilatation together with mild TR. So we differentiated that um, a little bit more, but we also quite clearly state that if the patient has um, severe TR as a concomitant disease, regardless of whether that's primary or secondary, then they need surgery. Okay. And that should not be um, uh, approached just in a transcatheter approach. procedure. Yeah. What about the heart team? Is there something new about the heart team? Uh, I don't know more people involved, uh, the discussions. The core members are very clear, clearly defined. And, you can... and advanced, uh, advanced imaging, especially with CT and CMR, mm -hmm. are uh, important aspects. Um, with uh, CT, we often now are using it not only for looking at the valvular disease, but also looking at coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. So yes. that has been increased to a 1B recommendation that we do not need to do invasive coronary angiography if the patients have a moderate or less pre-test likelihood of coronary artery disease. And you would be surprised how many risk factors they can have and still qualify as moderate or less. And we very clearly state that in there. You do not need to do invasive left-sided um, uh, coronary angiography in these patients if the cardiac CT uh, shows no evidence of coronary artery disease. Yeah, and another important topic in terms of heart team and uh, heart valve centers, we also define very clearly what's a heart valve clinic and a heart valve center. And there is also a table, an, an ICE table actually, where we clearly differentiate what are complex procedures that need to be performed in a high volume center with a established heart team and so on, yeah. So it seems very like integral, uh, like integrating everything. Uh, very complete. Um, another uh, question that I have, it's um, because we have viewers from everywhere, how do these guidelines apply to the rest of the world, not just Europe? So maybe, I'm from LATAM, you are from LATAM. Maybe I'll try <laughs> attack, uh, uh, um, approach that one because I've been involved, so I, had, I was the co-chair of the 2023 um, guidelines, ESC guidelines on endocarditis. Mm -hmm. And then there was an initiative to try to make um, uh, specific guidelines for low to middle income countries. It becomes very complex, however, because first of all, the resources are very regional and it's hard for people in Europe to say exactly what different um, regions across the world have for available re resources. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, just because the resources are limited doesn't necessarily mean that you should be adjusting the class of the recommendation. Yeah. And so there's actually been a, a pullback on that. There's been basically, we, we give the best recommendation, recommendations that we can based on the highest level evidence that we have available to us. And we try to avoid trying to dictate to different countries what they should be doing. But cardiac surgery in general needs to be encouraged more by governments in developing countries. This is a very strong way to um, improve prognosis, improve survival, and better treat patients with valvular heart disease, without a doubt. And Lorena, as you mentioned, I know the circumstances in Colombia and in South America, the other problem is 
that uh, we do not have specific regional uh, evidence or we do not have own evidence and that's something we'd have to work on in Latin America to get specific own recommendations and guidelines. We do. So just um, some polemic about <laughs> yeah, uh, about the guidelines and uh, of course you know what I'm talking about. Um, the TAVI recommendation and uh, um, 70 years old recommendation. So what happened there? What is the evidence? So, um, you know, at the highest level of evidence is randomized clinical trials. Any methodolo methodologist, any epidemiologist will tell you this. And just looking at retrospective data is definitely a lower level of evidence. You can see that on the WHO website, World Health Organization. You can read it in any textbook. Because the randomized controlled trials control for unmeasured bias. Mm -hmm. Retrospective studies are always subject to unmeasured bias. And if we have two treatment strategies that are available, and a doctor, or even more so, a team of doctors says, hey, this is a better strategy for this patient, and this is a better strategy for that patient, that is, by definition, selection bias. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you cannot compare the two groups, no matter what sort of magical matching scheme you come up with, because the unmeasured factors are not taken into consideration. So we have randomized trials. What have the randomized trials shown? They've shown superior outcomes for TAVI over SAVR at one year. Doesn't matter if it's low, intermediate, or high risk. And equivalent outcomes at five and 10 years. Doesn't matter if it's low, medium, or high risk. In the middle of the conversations and the discussions, then we had to be confronted with uh, the results of Dedicate, which showed definitely worse outcomes for SAVR one year. Of course, we need more time to see what happens. But it was an industry uh, independent study. So that question was taken off the table. Also, UK TAVI was not industry sponsored, and that mm -hmm. showed equivalent outcomes at five years. So that's industry um, bias is, is gone from the table. And basically, we were uh, faced with the situation where um, our colleagues said, look, the results for surgery are, you know, they make us worry, at least at one year. And the options were, okay, we say, okay, TAVR is better than surgery at one year, and they're both equivalent at five and 10 years, regardless of what your risk is. That was going to be one option for the recommendations. Then I would ask the surgical community out there, how many patients are, are going to undergo uh, surgery in the future? I would yeah. say none. Or we, we kept with age, but then we had to adjust it um, to reflect the fact that uh, this early penalty that you pay with surgery has more of an impact the older you are. So it was a, you know, a, there was very detailed discussions. It was a negotiation. It was not easy, but let's put it this way. We had 100 reviewers on this uh, document. And this was the best compromise we could come up with. Perfect. Anything you want to add? Last thing I would add is there's also been, uh, between the age of 70 and 75, several hundred randomized patients in the low-risk trials. And thus far, we don't see a negative impact of TAVR thus far in those patients. So just to you know put that into perspective, for people because I know that this is the one thing they like to focus on, but I would like to say there's a lot of wins for surgery in this uh, document and therefore we should also focus on some of those aspects. For us, by Cuspid and so on. Yeah. To summarize or grab it out, um, anything else you want to add about the guidelines, the whole thing, the process? It's a, it's a, you know, inherently um, flawed process, but it's the best process that we have at this time. And I would just add to the surgeons out there listening, please, we need more randomized data. If you're arguing like we are with methodologists, with cardiologists, and you try to present them with a, a single case series saying how great this guy's results were, they'll be like, well, that's not applicable because guidelines are for the general community. They're not for specific surgeons or specific centers. They're for the general community. And I think we can be uh, proud of the fact that we found uh, several wins for surgery, but we need more randomized data. So thank you very much to you both. Thank you for joining us here at EATS. Keep enjoying EATS 2025 and Copenhagen, and please stay with us at CTS Next. Bye. Thank you, Lorena.